All right, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our first installment of Danley Sound Labs Fireside Chats. So we've got uh, Ivan Beaver here with us today. He'll be he'll be talking a little bit about uh, comb filtering. Um, excited to see what he has to say. He showed me some a few slides from his. Uh, um, from little PowerPoint stuff he wants to share with everyone. So I think this will be really great. So we are recording this session. Um, so we'd appreciate it if everyone would leave the their mics muted and whatnot. Um, we're gonna use the chat function. Um, this is Josh Millward, by the way. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please make use of the chat function. You can send your questions to me and um, when Ivan gets done presenting, we will run through those questions and we'll talk about them. So I um, so really appreciate everyone showing up today. And uh, yeah, I think with that, I'm going to find Ivan here in the list. I saw him a minute ago, but uh, we've got a bunch of people showing up. So he's moved around. There he is. We'll go ahead and make him the presenter. So. Ivan, um, I guess you have the floor, my friend. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, thank everybody for uh, being here today. And uh, hopefully we can uh, all learn a little bit and uh, have some fun with this. So uh, today we'll be talking about comb filtering. It's a term that's used quite often and um, uh, a lot of people use it. They don't understand what it means. Um, so hopefully this will clear some things up for you. Um, hang on, I've got to move some stuff around on my screen here. here. Um, generally, it's a term that's, that's used but misunderstood. It's not this big, hairy, sonic monster, uh, like nasty distortion or whatever, but often, often it's a subtle effect. It's often heard as a dulling of the sound or a hollowness, and all that depends upon the frequency of the particular comb filter um, of where it's happening. Oops, hang, you know, hang on a second. I'm not. Um, so unless you're living like in an anechoic chamber, you're going to hear comb filtering all the time. Just two people talking in a room. You're hearing it as it bounces off the walls, um, the floor, desk, that type of thing. And it doesn't matter what the source is, whether it's acoustic because people talking or it's amplified through a sound system or speech or whatever, it has to do with frequency. And simply stated, it's the same signal arriving at a location at different times, as simple as that. And when they arrive at different times, you have notches or, or cancellations in the amplitude or the frequency response. And it can be from two sound sources, like two different loudspeakers or reflections, like a loudspeaker and something bouncing off a wall, or it can be two microphones on a single sound source, like putting two microphones, micing a drum, if they're at different distances, you're going to have notches in the frequency response and cancellation. And the, the difference in the uh, signal arrival times is what determines the frequency of the notches. We'll get to the math here in a little bit. But the first or the lowest frequency notch is going to be one half of the difference of the arrival times. The rate at which the further notches are are going to be multiples of the differences of the arrival times. And when you look at it on a linear scale, the notches look like the teeth of a comb. And hence the reason it's called comb filtering. Uh, we live in a logarithmic world, so we view things a little bit differently. And so uh, I'll show you stuff later on. It'll be on the logarithmic scale. So here's the math. You know, you don't need to bring out your calculus books or anything like this. this is, we're going to keep it simple, casual, and uh, uh, elementary school math here. So. Um, Anyway, so let's say that you just take, you've got two signals that are two, millipar, two milliseconds apart. The speed of, of sound is approximately 1,125 feet per second, 343 meters per second for the, you and the rest of the world. Uh, the physical distance of these is two and a quarter feet or 0.686 meters. Now, th these particular things are not important to figuring out the math of the cone filtering and that sort of thing. But to give you a relative idea of the size of the difference of the path lengths that we're talking about here. 
So the formulas for the comb filtering are two milliseconds is 500 hertz. That ought to be standard. Everybody all know one millisecond is 1,000 hertz, two milliseconds is 500, 10 milliseconds is 100. That ought to be stuff you just spit off the top of your head. But anyway, uh, the formula is one over 0 0.002 seconds uh, is 500 hertz. And so half of 500 is 250 hertz. Those are the numbers that we need for this particular example. So the first notch is going to be at 250 hertz. And then each of the higher notches will be at the rate of the arrival time, um, if, uh, which is two milliseconds or 500 hertz. So the notches are going to be regularly spaced at, at 250, 750, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way on up. So here's here's some examples of what it looks like. Now this is a uh, this is not a, a loudspeaker measurement. This is an electronic measurement. So this is textbook perfect uh, comb filtering. Um, a one foot difference or point uh, th point three meters. Uh, you have notches starting here at a little over 500 hertz, 560 or something like that. Um, a two foot difference. It's going to be lower. You have a it's a longer difference, lower frequency, and then we're going to do a higher half that half the distance to the original one. And as you can see, that the the notches are wider apart, but they also start up higher. So the the greater the distance between the arrivals, the lower the the first starting frequency, and the greater the distance between the arrival, the closer the frequencies are together. Because they're the you know on a hertz standpoint they're they're less hertz than they are um, uh, than the higher ones. Okay, why do they actually cancel? What causes the cancellation? Well, it's that term that again another term that gets thrown around a lot. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but it's all about the phase. Um, and phase is something that's greatly misunderstood by a lot of people. But let's uh, we're not going to get off on that. But it has to do with the phase difference at a particular location and arrival time, and different locations and different distances will have a different comb filter pattern, different frequencies that are being canceled. Since phase is time measured in degrees and it's based on the wavelength, the signals that are 180 degrees out of phase at a frequency based on the arrival time will cancel the most, and the frequencies that are in phase less than 90 degrees will sum. And a lot of the, the 180 degrees, a lot of people say that's out of polarity. Polarity has to do with an equal and everything all the way across the frequency response. Phase is frequency dependent. So since the, the difference of arrival time would mean that the two signals are out of time, but in polarity, they'll sum together a bit at the frequency of the difference, but they'll cancel at half of the time, 180 degrees out of phase, and the subsequent higher frequencies based on the time difference in the arrivals. So a couple simple graphics here. In phase signals will sum together. So here we have a sine wave. We add another sine wave. I offset it a little bit just so we can see it. And when you put the two together, you have twice the amplitude. That, that's um, all standard and easy right there. So the out of phase cancels, uh, out of phase cancels, out of phase signals will cancel. So here we have the first signal, the first arrival, and now we have the second arrival coming in. Now that second arrival is in polarity. It may look like it's out of polarity, but it's in polarity, but it's offset by a half of a wavelength. Okay, the reason, as you can see, it starts a little bit later in time. Okay, so it's in polarity, but it's out of time. Okay, and that's a very important distinction and when you have the two of those, you end up with, with a complete cancellation at that particular frequency. So here's what it looks like on a couple of different things. This is the modeling. Um, as you can see on um, the, the, the left-hand picture here, here's a simple room. There's a loudspeaker up in the, oh, where my cursor go? Hang on a second, my well, cursor has disappeared. There we go. The uh, uh, loudspeaker up in the air, we have different microphones that are out in the room that are different colors, and those are the frequency responses that we see on the graph on the right. So there'll be a lot of graphs here I'm going to show, and, and they all follow the same 
basic things, uh, ideas. So here we have uh, three, and these are just random uh, frequencies that I just chose to uh, keep things interesting. So at a little over three kilohertz, we've got two loudspeakers. And I did add a red microphone here that you don't see in the first one. And you can see that in, it's in right down the middle of the room. And you can see its frequency response up here among the other ones. And if you look at the different microphones, you'll see that the um, uh, the comb filtering uh, notches are, are they're not the same. They're at different frequencies. That's because each of the microphones has a different physical distance between the two loudspeakers, so they have a different character. At 500 hertz, well, the, as you'll notice, the frequency response is staying the same, but the uh, the patterns, basically the coverage patterns on the floor look entirely different. And if we go a little bit lower still, down to 100 hertz, we have a different coverage pattern yet. So where do you want to sit in the room? The only logical choice with two loudspeakers is right down the middle where you're equal distance right between the two. Anywhere else is going to give you notches in the response. And subwoofers have the same problem also. It's not just uh, full range cabinets. And whether, it doesn't matter whether they're spaced on the floor or they're floor and flown, the results are gonna be the same, but they're gonna be in different planes that are 90 degrees apart. And the interference patterns are gonna change from, instead of being from side to side, if they're sitting on the floor, they'll be front to back if they're up in the air. Whoops. Okay, I, I double click. sorry about that. So the first, the first slide up there is 31 hertz with subs on the floor. And you can see the interference patterns that are going on there. And to the right, you can see the uh, frequency response of the different microphones. So it depends on where you're at, you're going to end up, you know, you, you, if a kick drum is tuned at a particular frequency and you're in a null, you can say, hey, I can't even hear, I can't hear the kick, while other people will be having tons of kick. It's just that you happen to be sitting in a null. And down at 63 hertz, you can see that there's a different interference pattern. And up at 100 hertz, it's still a different interference pattern again. So you can see the, what's going on with space subs. Now here is a flown sub and a floor sub at, at 31 hertz. And again, you can see the frequency response on the right-hand side, the different mics over here on the left-hand side with the, two, uh, with the two speakers here. At 63 hertz, what's interesting is that we... Um, it's, it's loud down here in the front, and then it starts getting quieter, and then it starts getting louder towards the back of the room, okay? Because you, you've got this area of, uh, of cancellation based upon the spacing of the, of the subs. If we go up to 100 hertz, we end up with a different area of cancellation that's a lot, uh, and the, um, the bluer, the, the darker the blue, the quieter it is, the redder the red, the louder it is, okay? Uh, for those not used to doing models. Um, so here is a single sub on the floor. And as you can see, the frequency response on the right-hand side, um, the, since it's a single speaker, there's no cancellations going on. This assumes no walls. We're outside in the middle of a field. Um, the, uh, and when we fly that sub, we have the same frequency response. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that the, um, it's, so it's not a matter of floor or flown, it's a matter of, so there's no cancellation differences there. But what you will notice, and this is a completely different topic, but has to go with the, um, with the amplitudes, is that if it's on the floor, it's gonna be louder in the front than it is at the back, while when it's flown, it's more even from front to back. So what about mains? So this is a flown main with a sub on the floor. I chose a different model sub just because. Um, and you can see the, the cancellations that are, um, that are happening between the floor and the, um, uh, the, the, the main and the floor. The, um, down here is when you put the, uh, the main and the sub that are flown together. You have a much flatter amplitude response. You don't have the cancellation. Why? Because the arrival times from the two different loudspeakers are arriving at the same time 
at, at each location. So you end up having a smoother response. And so when we add the, the uh, a sub on the floor, which is not uncommon, because, hey, we'll put a sub on the floor for the people up close and we'll put one up high for the people in the back, what do you end up doing? You end up actually causing a very erratic frequency response, depends on where you're at. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the overall, um, uh, the three options there, when the main and the sub are, are, right, are co-located right next to each other, we have the, the, the flattest, um, the smoothest frequency response. So how do we get rid of some comb filtering, okay? Well, if it's reflections, then we can use absorption on the reflecting surfaces, or if it's a microphone, put it against the boundary. That way we don't have, if it's, you know, if you've got a microphone a couple feet from a wall, you're gonna pick up a reflection from the wall, put it up against the wall. You just got rid of that reflection. And it has to be right up against it, um, uh, or what's called a ground plane measurement. But the ground plane doesn't have to be on the ground, it can be on a vertical surface. It basically just means a large surface up against the microphone. In the case of loudspeakers, use as few of them as possible, as we saw in some of the earlier slides. And, and one is preferable to be the, uh, uh, the least amount of cone filtering, so the direct signal is only one path. And if you're using multiple loudspeakers, you want to get them as close together and, and in a quarter inch of the highest frequency of interest being the goal. And this is the drivers, not the edges of the cabinets, okay? So you have to consider the location of the drivers inside the cabinets. So at, at 10 kilohertz is 1.35 inches or 0 0.0343 uh, meters. So one quarter of that is you do. <laughs> it means getting the drivers really, really close together, which is a physical impossibility. Um, so that creates some problems. So you either get them very, very close together or a country mile off. In between, you're gonna have some problems. And by having the arrival times a good bit apart, you move the first and the most dominant comb filter to a lower frequency, hopefully below the high pass filter point, such as on a, uh, like a downfill uh, cabinet. If you move that first filter point down below the high pass filter, you only have one speaker reproducing those frequencies. And as you move up in frequencies, they're gonna be closer and closer together. So there's gonna be less noticeable interference. It'll still be there, but it's not gonna be as, as noticeable. But it presents a new problem, which is a smearing effect, which is multiple sounds arriving at, um, uh, at different times. And you've, you know, you've, you've uh, got one problem, you fixed one problem, but you've added a another one and somewhere you gotta strike a balance. And if you say, well, I'll just delay that speaker. And it's like, well, you can only delay it to fix it at one location. And you gotta be careful because while you fix it at one location, depends on which one you choose, you might make it um, uh, worse for everybody else. So you, um, what it comes down to is a compromise. Audio is all about compromise and understanding what the compromise is is going to help uh, you to uh, have a better overall uh, um, solution and choose what's best for a particular application. So, anyway, that's that's my uh, little uh, quick little PowerPoint there, and um, I think we're going to uh, open it up to um, to questions now. That I think uh, uh, that are going to be Josh is going to feed me some questions, and I'll do my best to uh, try to clarify some things and. Um, uh, answer them and hopefully we don't get too sidetracked. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing that uh, stuff with us, Ivan. I think it's uh, pretty interesting. I know uh, comb filtering is one of those things that we hear people talk about a lot. And often when you um, when you engage people and talking about it, you suddenly realize that they don't quite know exactly what they're talking about. So we really appreciate you taking your time and sharing this with us. So Tim uh, just asked a question a few minutes ago about, um, you know, obviously, you know, uh, we see we saw in your slide that there were issues when you would put more than one loudspeaker up and it's presenting the same signal. So uh, so Tim was asking about, uh, can you speak to uh, left, right, center versus stereo 
versus single point and uh, and what that means with general comb filtering issues. Okay, well, and that is more along the lines of a, of a system design standpoint. And in an LCR type system, one of the things that when people do that, the main thing that I see that people miss is that each one of the left, center, and right systems needs to cover the entire room. If it doesn't, then you're gonna to have to rely on the other speakers to do it. So when you're doing something with an LCR setup, the idea is to do a good bit of, of panning. And if you go to the center, if you want something to be in the middle, you assign it to the middle speaker and do not have it coming out of the left and the rights. And if the south system is designed properly, then it's gonna cover the entire room. And let's say you want to pan something to, off to the left because that, well, that's where the keyboard player is. You pan it off to the left and try to pan it a good bit so that there's more energy coming out of the left speaker than there is out of the right. It's when you do the subtle pans, that's when you start having problems. It works great on headphones, but doesn't work so well on the, um, uh, for a, a number of people spread out over a distance. And if you pan it, even it, so if you pan it all the way to the left and your sound system is properly designed, everybody in the room is going to hear it. And um, so think of it as three different sound systems. You're not going to have, the, but you don't need to do the hard panning. The other thing with comb filtering is that it's amplitude dependent. And you have the most comb filtering when the signals are equal. If one signal is louder than the other, then the notches are not going to be as deep. Um, the old standard has been 10 dB. That's been the, uh, anything more than 10 dB difference and it doesn't matter, but some tests have been done and up to 18 dB is noticeable. Now that's in studio and controlled situations and that sort of thing. So if you're gonna, so think of it, the, the more the difference in level, the less, the comb filtering is actually going to be an issue. It's when the, the signals are equal in level, that's when you're gonna have the maximum comb filtering. Does that help maybe? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really important point in that, uh, um, like in the example that you showed us on uh, uh, on the one slide where the, the two loudspeakers are having a heyday with comb filtering, um, the important detail is that those two loudspeakers are presenting the same exactly uh, content the same signal is present in both uh, the minute that you differentiate those signals and make them not the same um, you instantly reduce the comb filtering because uh, because the the issue is the same signal in that right. spot yeah so um, so we're open for some more questions. If anybody has more questions, um, if you want to poke them into the chat thing there, or I guess if we're available here, as long as we don't get too out of control, if you want to unmute and chat with us, I suppose that would be all right. Um, so I should, while we're waiting for that, I'll go ahead and plug in here. You know, this is going to be a regular uh, Thursday um thing i guess so uh, obviously everybody figured out that uh what time 11 a.m eastern daylight time is in their zone and uh and so we're going to be doing it at this time every thursday um be doing different topics all the time so it's not just uh comb filtering week after week after week uh so next week uh, i'm actually going to be talking about our dna series products uh we're just going to do a quick overview and, and cover some of the details that people often have questions about uh, when they're setting up uh, um, particularly our amplifiers and things like that, like what do you need to do for power and, and things like that. So we'll we'll definitely um, definitely cover a bunch of that stuff next week. But uh, let's see, we got a couple of quick questions here. Let me read them. And we are going to try to keep things uh on the, the 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 fireside chat we're not trying to get gonna dig real deep into stuff we're gonna try to keep it light try to keep it you know uh, more of a casual type of a thing so um uh, uh 
you know, and, and this can be, you know, uh, questions can be anything, you know, audio stuff and whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be about the particular topic. We would kind of prefer it to be each time to try to keep the, uh, the general interest on that topic. And so many things in audio, they do relate uh, that they're so intertwined. One thing intertwines with something else of, uh, you know, well, I can't put my sub and my mains together. Well, yeah, because it's it's physical, physically impossible in a particular situation. Well, then there's going to be some compromises, and there's some things you just some things you're just going to have to 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 deal with, and then not um, and just and basically ignore it. Yeah, this is what's going to happen in this particular room. But given the circumstances that you had to deal with, there's not a lot of options. You know. Um, the uh, one thing that I see a lot of times that people talking about, well, you know, I'm going to use a, a, a I'm going to mic, mic the speaker up close and then I'm going to like on a guitar amp, then I'm going to mic it further away to get a room sound. And then I'm going to do this and we're going to add all of these things together. Well, that would be nice if uh, sound traveled at the speed of light, but it doesn't. And since the slow speed of sound, that's what actually causes the comb filtering. And um, so you end up, with you're, you're trying to combine things, but you're also going to be adding in comb filtering. And that can create a whole new set of, uh, well, why, why didn't this work the way that it does? Well, because you've got multiple sources at multiple distances. Um, now, in the case of like a, um, um, uh, like say a, a, uh, uh, a guitar amp, okay, I can delay my microphone the space the, the say it's two feet further out and one up against the cone. I can put a delay in there. I can delay that second one. I mean, delay the first one to where it matches up with the arrival of the second one. And then I've and I've taken care of that problem. But I'm only interested in one spot in space. The problem gets to be is when the um, when you have multiple people in multiple places, that's where the cone filtering gets. You can't use a simple delay because I can't use a different delay for each person. So uh, we've had some good questions pop up here. Um, I'm just going to run down the list here. Um, Devin asked, uh, can you please speak to subwoofer arrays and providing the most even coverage to the whole crowd? Um, you know, how obviously when you set up uh, subwoofers, if you're doing a, a typical, you know, bunch of subwoofers in front of the stage kind of thing, um, depending on how many you're using, they can start to get really wide. And, yep. and obviously that can cause, you know, the, the distance from one end to the other can cause some, uh, some comb filtering and can cause some directionality to happen with, uh, with the lobes that are coming off of, of that array of subwoofers. Uh, so you want to approach that a little bit, Ivan? Yeah. Um, yeah, what what Josh is alluding to is like, let's say that there's we got a big audience and you can't put them all in the middle. And um, so you spread them out across the front. And when you end up with a long enough line and it, it, it has to do with frequency, basically you end up with what's what I call a sideways line array effect. And line arrays work by cancellation and a narrowing of the pattern due to the cancellation, which is the comb filtering. And so what happens is the when you put them across the front, then as long as you're directly in front of it, you're fine. But as soon as you start to move off to the side, that's where you get to have a problem. If you just got a couple of them in the middle, then it's going to, as you move off to the side, the level is going to drop off slowly. If you've got a line, let's say, you know, 20 or 30 feet long, then when you get out of that pattern, it's going to drop, drop off dramatically. Now, in some cases, that can be very advantageous. If you're doing fairs and festivals and you got vendors set up on either side, they don't want all the low end and because they want to be able to hear people and place orders and, and get their money. Um, but if it's just a big concert, you're trying to do everybody, then you have a problem. One way, there's a couple of different approaches that you can do. One is if you uh, delay the outer ones a little bit Think of it as a pebble in the pond, of dropping a pebble in the pond. It takes time for the ripples to get out to different points. 
and um, but you don't delay them typically. The best thing to do is to play in the various models. Danley has Direct, which is a free model. Lots of other manufacturers have their own other models. They'll all work the same way. They'll give you the same results. Um, the um, uh, So you, you'll delay them, but not necessarily by the actual physical distances. You end up typically delaying them less than the physical distances. Um, another way is to actually curve the, su the subwoofers into an arc, and um, and so you're forming a quote the natural ripple shape. That works well as long as you have the real estate. But a lot of times you've only got five to maybe ten feet in front of the stage till you get to the barricade. I can't have a subwoofer array that comes out twenty feet. Um, the promoters aren't going to aren't going to allow that. So that becomes a situation dependent. And everything starts to have prop that there is no ultimate solution. And part of the problem is, is it's one thing to think about just the subwoofers, okay? Oh, wow, I've got, I did this perfect delay. I've got perfect loud coverage, the subwoofers and all of this. That's great. Is it a subwoofer concert? What about your mains? What are you going to delay your mains to now? Are you going to delay them to the center subwoofer? Or to the ones that are actually underneath the the, uh, the array, and it depends on where you're standing. You're going to end up with a different delay time for any seat that you end up trying to choose. So you end up this comes down to this big compromise thing, and it's, and it's trying to understand the compromises. And a lot of times, there's just things that don't worry about it. It, it is what it is. We just got to just live with it. So. Um, uh, I had a friend of mine, and uh, he was talking about, he was asking me about one big show that he did, and the stage was 100, and, no, it was 50 meters wide, so 150 foot wide, just the stage, and then we had the loudspeakers, and they had, I think it was like 180 double 18s. What are you going to align to? You just have to just choose something and just go for it, because any scenario you try to choose is going to come up with a completely different answer. So um, it's uh, uh, playing around in models is a good way to learn about how things happen. Um, and um, but there there is no simple solution. You're not going to end end up with it being perfect. So right. sorry about that. Sorry about that reality. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, reality uh, raises its ugly head, and and not everything can be perfect every time. So uh, uh, <laughs> I have a couple of. Uh, we're going to answer a couple of questions here with uh, with the same answer. Um, I'm going to read the first question. Hold your tongue a little bit um, because there's a second question that uh, that also asks a similar kind of question, but in a different way. So uh, so Ed asked, uh, would it be implied that there is significant comb filtering in line arrays, especially uh, in the upper especially in the upper frequencies, or does the tighter vertical pattern eliminate the overlap and the comb filtering so okay. so, that, so that's one question okay, okay. and then uh, and then Kim had asked uh, would a traditional loudspeaker box with a separate woofer and horn have comb filtering issues as a single unit and if so would it be logical to assume that uh, that multiple such devices would create more of an issue so so I feel that these questions are related yeah because yeah. they talk about arraying loudspeakers together, you know, uh, two different ways, sort of, but I think they're related um, because, you know, they talk about having multiple loudspeakers and the the comb filtering issues that can be created by by having that together. And I think it's it's in a way related to what you just were talking about with the subwoofers, just moving up the frequency range a little bit to some to the mids and and high frequencies. So yeah. if, I guess if you want to address Kim's question first about the the comb filtering issues that can happen between the, the woofer and the high frequency driver in like a two-way box first and then we can come back to uh, yeah. come back uh, to uh, to Ed's question about yeah. uh, about the comb filtering and line arrays. Yeah they are definitely totally related. Um, in a single cabinet when you've got the um, uh, the drivers that are that are that are offset from each other, you're going to at one point they're going to be equal distance between it. So everything's fine there. But if you move vertically up or down in the coverage pattern, the distance between the drivers changes. 
So therefore the cone filtering is gonna be different. It's gonna mostly happen around the crossover point where the level between the, um, the, the we'll just do a, a, just a two-way cabinet, between the lows and the highs are equal. A little bit above and a little bit below that in frequency, it's not gonna be as noticeable going back to the earlier conversation about level. So it's going to be happening mostly around the crossover point, which unfortunately typically happens to be around the middle part of the vocal range in most cabinets. So therefore, it's going to affect the intelligibility. So the, the, the old thing of a single driver being the, the, the best sound system, that's correct is a single full range driver is going to give you the best phase response. You're going to be equal distance from it. Uh, because there's only one thing, uh, I mean, your distance may change as you move around, but there's only one thing that you're getting a signal from. So with the, um, and, and going on to the second part of the question, with the line arrays, this is the same thing. You can't help but hear multiple boxes. Now, one of the fallacies is that, well, they only have a 10 degree vertical pattern. The problem is, is it comes down to that darn physics stuff. and the, um, with horns, the narrower the pattern is, the bigger the horn has to be to have the same kind of pattern control. So a horn that has a wider pattern that is the same size as a narrower one is going to have the, is going to have pattern control to a lower frequency. So, I mean, if you wanted to, to do the game, okay, here's a line of 16 boxes. Here, we'll turn them on one at a time. Can you hear all 16? Yes. They're slightly different in level, but you can still hear all 16. Guess what? You're a different physical distance away from each one of them. Some of them are gonna be kind of close together, so their cone filtering is gonna be up high, but, the one in, but if you're up close, the one on the bottom versus the one in the top, they're gonna be a dramatically different um, di physical distance apart. Therefore, that cone filtering is gonna start to be at a much lower frequency. And you can easily hear this if you walk from, like put pink noise into a line array and just walk from front to back. And what you'll hear as you walk from front to back, you'll hear the swishing, the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And what that is, that's the different fundamental cone filter frequencies based on your physical position of you walking from front to back. So, um, you know, it depends on where you're seated depends on where the which notches are going to be most dominant. And so, um, uh, and it's, it's the cancellation of the cone filtering. That's what actually causes the whole line array to have that, that the overall narrowing of the pattern of the whole um, thing happens at, because of all the cancellation that's going on. And so it's, um, uh, in, that, in one way it's good, but if you look at the models of coverage and stuff, you'll see just like we did on the like the flown subs and the um, uh, the floor and the flown subs. Well, you have the, you saw this one ring out there. Well, if I had done uh, multiple subs and stuck one in the middle, then we would have had multiple rings. And so what you'll see is different um, hot spots and low spots in the coverage, and they're going to be different at different frequencies. Maybe that helps to. Uh, to something, but they all it all works by the it all comes down to phase and the phase cancellation because of different times. And the um, one thing that I did say earlier that is it's not quote an error, it may be slightly deceiving. Is it and not it's um, you want to keep anything within uh, a quarter wavelength, which is 90 degrees, but at 90 degrees, you still have 3 dB of summation. So as you go out a little bit wider. I think around 120 degrees is where you have two sources. They can be 100 and 120 degrees out of phase and have no difference in level. Beyond 120 degrees, there starts to be cancellation. Uh, shorter than 20, 120 degrees, there's addition. But the general rule for is 3 dB or 90 degrees. Um, so you want you want to have them close together. All right. Cool. Thank you for answering that, Ivan. So uh, uh, Jonathan asked, uh, can comb filtering present from a loudspeaker design? So uh, comb filtering that's inherent in the design of a loudspeaker, and he used the example of the Bose 802. 
be corrected through DSP. So can I, you know, we have lots of fancy DSPs available on the market these days and lots of them have uh, all kinds of really cool filtering and stuff available in them. So can I take that and throw it at one of these loudspeakers and make it sound good without the, uh, without the comb filtering in it? Yeah, Ab absolutely. But, but here's, there's, there's a couple of caveats. So let's take the 802 as the example. First of all, we need eight DSP channels with eight amplifiers, okay? So you're going to have to rewire the cabinet to do that, and you have to choose your your listening position, okay? And we can delay everything, whichever the closest speaker is, that's zero time. I mean, the zero time to be subtracted away from the other one. So if you want to work backwards, you take the furthest loudspeaker as zero, and then add additional delay to all the other ones and then you'll have you can line them up to where you can have all the the the, the delay times will be totally right as long as you don't move yeah as that's only for one move, position right <laughs> it, that's, that's one seating position as soon as you move a foot to the left or a foot to the right you need a, a completely different set of delays so in the case of like studio monitors to where Yes, um, I'm sitting at this position in the console, and I, I'm not going to move. Then, yes, that could be done, or or a home listening environment, or something like that. As long as you're going to do it for one seat, but doing it for multiple seats, I can't have different delays on different speakers for different uh, seating positions. So you have to choose a spot and uh, and go for it. There was I remember years ago in my very first. Uh, uh, the first smart class that I took, I had been using smart for a while back, but this was back at the EAW factory. And with the, uh, I was doing install at the time, and I was the only installer. Most everybody else there was a uh, was a tour guy, and so which I did 25 years in the in the tour industry. But um, so anyway, we were talking about the question came up: what, where do you align to? You've got this big, you got a big arena full of stuff, multiple speakers, and all this. What do you align to? And one guy said, and it's the best answer, and I've used it many, many times. He's the, he says, I know exactly where I align to. It's five feet in front of me and 10 feet to my right. And everybody goes, what? That doesn't make any sense. He said, yes, it does. Because that that's where the tour manager sits. And if the tour manager likes the sound that night, he'll give me an extra 100 bucks. And so if you, you have to choose a spot, and he's choosing the spot that puts the most money in his pocket. And, um, and it's like, you know what, that makes sense to me because it's as good of a reason as any place else. But when you have multiple speakers, you have to choose a spot. And that's just, and, you know, um, and that's part of the compromise. So. Yep, yep, absolutely. And that's that's a good point. The guy knew where, uh, where his uh, bread was being buttered. Exactly. And uh, he, he was doing what he needed to do to make sure that it, it stayed that way. So that exactly. makes a lot of good sense. All right. So uh, so Coop asked, um, he had a question asked of him the other day, um, and specifically uh, in relationship to a situation where you put a downfill box above a main loudspeaker. Right. Um, so you've got a main loudspeaker, but then you put a downfill box above it. Yep. And I that assume, made, I assume this would be then pointed down to the air, uh, pointed down shooting right in front of yeah, exactly. the, uh, the yep. main loudspeaker. So, so does that cause comb filter? Or so can you talk about any comb filtering that would be created by that? Or uh, is that in some way exempt from that? Or, or what, what is the ramifications of doing something like that? I guess this sort of speaks to sort of uh, cross-firing loudspeakers in front yeah. of one another too. Yeah. And and the thing is is it's uh, uh, it's not like the sound waves they hit each other and they reflect off each other. This is not a billiard table, okay? Um, so these aren't ping pong balls or or um, uh, uh, or, or pool balls being uh, bouncing around, okay? The, the the patterns are still there as they um, as they go out, and you're going to um, end up what you end up is the same thing from a delay standpoint it doesn't matter if it's above or below the mains you're going to have the same issues that you're going to have to be concerned with and at some point you're going to have overlapping patterns so 
the there is no quote proper delay for um, setting a, a, a downfill versus, uh, versus the mains that's proper for a particular seat, but not for multiple seats. So where I try when I try to do the alignments, I try to choose the seat where the interaction is the most, which is uh, if you go back to the what we remember is the um, um, uh, uh, the difference when, when when the levels are the loudest, that's where you have the most interaction. So I choose the worst spot and then do the alignment there. And as I like in a, in a case of an auditorium, as I move forward closer to the front, I'm moving more into the downfill and out of the main. So therefore, the cone filtering is going to be less. And as I move towards the back of the room, I'm hearing more of the main and less of the downfill. So um, I, I choose the, the worst spots, make it as good as I can there, and then just accept whatever's happening on either side of that, that it's going to be a little bit less. And whether or not it's above or below the main, that's more of a physical thing. Of uh, sometimes it's due to the that's height more, of the ceiling. You that's you more dictated by the by the physical constraints of the installation, right? Right, by the architecture and stuff like that. And um, and one thing that that's often overlooked, and this depends upon the location of everything. But by putting the delay above the main loudspeaker, its coverage is going to be wider by the time it gets down to the floor. Now, that may be advantageous or not. So is the downfield trying to cover, you know, just three or four rows of seats, or are you trying to cover 10 rows of seats? Um, yeah, depending upon the height, makes you know, that makes yeah. a difference. That is a very application-specific uh uh, thing and then uh, the architecture is like wow the ceiling's too short it's just going to hang down too far but in some cases we almost put it above the speaker facing straight down you know and because we can we can kind of get it out of the way there so those you, you you make those decisions it's one of these compromise things yeah so the so basically the takeaway from that is that the, the it's the same compromises as traditionally mounting the downfill under the main loudspeaker in yeah. that the overlap area is the primary area of concern right. um, where you're going to have the, the comb filtering rear its head because you'll have the two sources. Um, yeah. So Alex asked a, a related question. So, um, so he asked, what kind of effect does box shading have? Uh, what kind of an effect does box shading on an array have in regards to comb filtering? So in this case, we've got our main and our downfill. So um, I assume he's talking about shading gain and shading frequency response to uh, to try and get that overlap to work better. Uh, yeah. And then and then he further asks, is shading effective? Okay. Um, well, I can you can look at it from two different standpoints. There's the the example that you gave. And then there's also the example of shading on a line array in which we'll turn the lower boxes down in level so they're not as, uh, uh, because they're physically closer to the people than the upper boxes. Um, so let me address that one first. And that, yes, that works um, as far as from a level standpoint. However, where it doesn't work is from the whole line array theory standpoint. And the whole line array theory and where everything is based off of is that they're all equal level. So as soon as you start adjusting the um, uh, the levels and turning the lower boxes down, now you don't have the same number of boxes contributing contributing to the line array effect. So therefore, the narrowing of the pattern, which is what's touted as being the big advantage, well, we're not doing that anymore because the we don't have as many boxes that are contributing as much energy so it's as soon as you start fixing one thing you're making something else worse um but the shading is just an amplitude thing and the ideal goal is should be that everybody receive the same the same sound intensity if at all possible um so that's that's our goal and turning boxes up or down in gain there there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever um, the big thing is just remembering that it comes filtering. It's when the maximum happens when they're equal in level. And as soon as one box is less, you have less comb filtering. But if you like a lot of things, you take it to the extreme 
well, if I turn the downfill down, then I won't have as much comb filtering. Well, let's just turn it off. Now I don't have any comb filtering. Great, but I also don't have any coverage for the seats that it's intending on covering. So that doesn't work. You know, we have to get some coverage there. So we've got to accept a certain amount of, um, of there's just certain things you have to accept in life. And that's one of them. Um, but, uh, and, but it's definitely, you know, you, um, uh, when, I, when I'm doing the uh, in a, uh, alignments is first thing I'll do is make sure that I get my amplitudes correct, get them equal for all the seats that I need. Then I'll start working on my delay time. And one thing that all that uh, is often overlooked in the case of downfills is the the main loudspeaker typically doesn't have the pattern control down low, so it's spilling plenty of lower frequency stuff onto the seats that are near the stage. What you're missing is the mids and the highs. So you use the downfill to just do the mids and the highs, and maybe you cross it over at 500 hertz. I've done some of them up at 800 hertz, um, just to try to get that clarity through there. Now, where that works is, is with the comb filtering, if my first notch is down below my crossover frequency, let's say my first notch is at two or 300 hertz, that's where it's gonna cause the most damage. Well, since the downfill is not reproducing those frequencies, it's not an issue. I only have one speaker, the main speaker, producing those frequencies. So therefore, there's nothing for it to cancel, so those frequencies are nice and smooth. So, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, with the case of downfills and the case of like balcony delays and stuff like this, don't always run them full range. They're, they're fill applications. You fill in what's missing. You don't add more to the whole overall problem by trying to make them run full range. The, the trick is not to have every loudspeaker sound exactly the same but to have the same sound in every seat, which often, very often means that the different loudspeakers are going to sound differently when listened to individually. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point and something that uh, I think some people often overlook because they they want, you know, this one loudspeaker to, to sound the very best that it can. And it's like, well, uh, is that what's really needed in this particular spot here? You know, like you said, you know, you cross over a a fill loudspeaker as high as 500, 800, or or whatever's needed. Whatever's uh, needed, exactly. For, for yeah. that spot, you know, because sure, it yeah. might be getting plenty of, of lows and low mids from from uh, the other loudspeakers that are already happening in the room. And if you have this loudspeaker also creating that that same uh, low, low mid stuff, you, if, you, if they're not in time exactly, which they won't be because well, as you move, be. <laughs> as you move your your time difference between the two loudspeakers is going to change so um so and that's just going to change the the comb filtering in those spots so that's a that's all really really great points so so scott asks uh in a typical left right setup it's pretty well understood that you're going to have comb filtering where the speakers overlap but when i've used well behaved loudspeakers such as sh50s I don't hear the effect nearly as bad as with conventional trap boxes. Is there an exponential effect to comb filtering? Um, well, think of it this way. So let's take a, um, uh, uh, a loudspeaker that has a single source of sound in and of itself. So we have, well, well let's, let's do like a three-way cabinet. So you got a three-way cabinet like the SH50 that has a single source of sound versus another one that's got low, mids, and highs. So I have comb filtering that's happening between the lows and the mids, and then between the mids and the highs of the single cabinet. Well, when I add the two together, now I have two SH, like two single sources of sound, two SH50s, and I have a certain comb filter pattern. <laughs> Excuse me. But when I add two other loudspeakers together, that have already got comb filtering and interference happening in and of itself, and I add that to another one, it basically is, and I don't know if it's exponential or, uh, but it is more, it is more than twice as much because I've got a lot more patterns that are going on rather than the interference from two. Now I've got the interference from four, at least four drivers. So, um, so yes, that's and that's what that's that's why having um uh, 
a, a really well-behaved speaker that has a single source of sound, they array better than those that have multiple sources of sound in between them because it just keeps, you end up with so many more different paths, you end up with so many notches in the in the response, it starts to be a mess. Right, yeah, that, that's a great point. So, uh, so Nathan asks, uh, this is kind of jumping back to our, our subwoofers that we were talking about earlier. Um, uh, when construction forces a spacing of subs that is less than optimal, so you have to put your subwoofer yeah. separated some yeah. distance yeah. just because of you know the conditions of the environment, have you found that some intentional narrow band EQ can mitigate or negate the worst effects of the natural comb filter that's caused by the separation? and provide a decent positive summation for the listening area? Uh, the answer is at one location, yes, that can definitely happen, okay? Um, the problem is if you start EQing something and, um, and the, first of all, you cannot EQ a cancellation notch. It might appear that way on your screen, and I would challenge you, use no, no, no smoothing and look at the total thing, but you can't cancel, you cannot EQ a cancellation. You can make it appear that way if you've got a lot of smoothing going on. So um, uh, so trying to EQ it may, may work in, in one spot, but in other spots, because like let's say you're trying to EQ a dip. Well, so I put a boost there, okay? Well, it might appear that way on your screen, um, but when you move to another seat, Oh, I've got a boost, so now I've got too much of something over in this other seat. And the if you've got to have a space subwoofer, one of the tricks is basically just turn one of them down in level. You know, three to six dB in level. Since the sub is for, in most cases omnidirectional, it's going to fill up the whole room just less in level as you go further away. So by turning the other sub down, and it doesn't matter whether it's the right or the left, and um, just turn it down in level, it, it would be rare that somebody would say, well, you know, the subs are a little bit louder on one side of the room than the other, you know. That's probably not going to happen unless they're really, unless they're walking the room a lot and really listening and that sort of thing. So um, now you're not going to end up with as much total SPL because you, you now turned one of them down but you're also ending up with less interference. So that, that's a little trick that can be done, but trying to do for the EQ, that's gonna be location specific, you know, because the different locations are gonna have notches and or peaks in different places. Now, one of the things that I kind of glossed over it earlier is that on the point to where the two, when you are at the, um, uh, the wavelength of the, um, to where they're adding together, so at the uh, 500 hertz, in, in my example I used earlier, at 500 hertz, there will be a little bit of a boost, uh, generally around a 3 dB boost. So you do get boost and cuts due to comb filtering. So, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something that you, um, you know, again, it's, it's a compromise. Um, and outdoors, it's a lot easier to realize what's going on. As soon as you put subs, as soon as you put a box inside a box, you have a whole nother set of problems and you have room modes that come into subs that, um, that a lot of people, um, uh, they're unaware of. Let me throw out a, a little fun thing to do if you've never done this, is go into a room, um, preferably be bigger than your living room, but it doesn't have to be a huge auditorium, and put in a, a sine wave, let's say 60 hertz. Put in 60 hertz at just a, a comfortable listening level. Now walk around, and you're going to hear spots that are really loud, and then you're going to hear spots that is like, wow, what happened? It completely went away. There is no 60 hertz at this, at this point. Now that's just with one loudspeaker. We're not talking comb filtering here, but it is comb filtering because of the reflections, okay? But it's comb filtering because of the room rather than the sources. So then put in another frequency and do it at something that is not a multiple of the other frequency, uh, 47 hertz. I don't think 60 and 47 have got anything in common, okay? Um, so put in 47 hertz. 
now, wait a minute, now I've got notches that are in different places than they were and peaks that are in different places. So there's nothing that you can do about that. That's the room. You're not going to EQ that because as soon as you start trying to fix it in one spot, you're going to either make it louder or softer, depends on which way you go with the EQ, at the other spots in the room. That's a room mode. And the, and the only solution to a room mode is a bulldozer, is get rid of the room. And, uh, and then they all go that's that's where that uh, the good old uh, uh, Caterpillar D9 room uh, equalizer yeah. comes into play, right? Yeah, the wrecking ball. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, you got to fix the room in order to change the uh, change the room modes, which is fundamentally a, a function of uh, uh, which is fundamentally a, a comb filtering function. It's based a comb on filter. The it's it's the because it's a path length that's based on a reflection that changes the phase at that particular frequency at that particular location. And if it's in phase, less than 90 degrees, it's going to sum. If it's out of phase, it's going to cancel. And um, so it's, uh, and so the, the room modes are a function of, um, of cone filtering. It's just, but it's not between two loudspeakers. And then when you put two loudspeakers that are spaced into a room, you've just got a whole new set of mess going on. You know, right. and it multiplies the problem. Yeah. What what I generally do whenever I'm uh, uh, doing room alignments is I'm a huge fan of using the multi mic technique, and I spread mics around all around all over the room. And when it comes down to look to doing the subs, is let me look for what most of the mics have in common. And if I got a few renegades, I just I just turn those off and don't even look at them because it's like okay, that's a room mode in that case. And there's nothing I can do about it. But if I see that, hey, everybody has got a hump here at 49 hertz, okay, I'll here, I'll dip that down because that way I'm doing something globally that's affecting most of the seats. Um, but if I've just got, you know, if I look at each one individually, I'll be EQ until the cows come home because you'll you'll change it every time you look at a different mic. So you look at the generalities on when it comes to subs and just do a global type eq and you, you just live with the rest and that's all you can do right right so uh so bill has a good question here he uh he mentions i've experienced that single source systems hold together at further distance away versus a line array barely getting energy past the mix position is this a function of the comb filtering that's inherent in the line array yeah it's, it's because of the cancellations and you start having more cancellations at, at different distances versus if you have a single source, it's just gonna drop off in level as you go further and further away. It's just gonna get quieter and quieter versus getting, um, remember what I was talking about with the subwoofers uh, laying on their sides. If, if you put one sub in the middle of the stage, as you walk off to the side, it's gonna slowly get quieter and quieter and quieter. But if you put a line of them, you're going to be made, you're going to have a lot of energy until you get outside of that line and this and then it's going to radically drop off due to all the cancellation that's going on so the uh, it all has to do with phase and you know phase has a lot of it's that's one of these terms that a lot of people use they don't really understand it and um uh you know the whole phase and polarity is a thing of like no they are completely different and um but the uh um, it's the phase relationship that if it's if it holds together and it's it's and it doesn't have the cancellations and line arrays fundamentally they work by cancellation and that's why when you add more boxes depends on where you're at you're not getting a whole bunch of summation in level because you've added a but you're getting you're getting addition in level but you're also getting addition in cancellation so you're not getting more and more that's why it takes so many boxes because each one is partially canceling the the other one, so um, uh, but that's why basically why they don't hold together, and that's why especially when you go outside and you have the wind blow, and that's why you hear the wind effects on, and it doesn't matter whether it's line arrays or as I'll say, and I hate to use this term point sources because most of the boxes that are called point sources are actually not, but uh, Many people call a point source just a box that has multiple drivers in it, but unless they're originating 
from a single source, it's not a point source. And um, so like uh, pile up a bunch of KF 850s like the old days and have the wind blow. And it just sounds like the wind's just carrying the sound all over the place. Yeah, but you hear a lot of the same. Uh, you, I've done that before, and you hear a lot of the same swishy swish going on that you yeah. hear with the uh, with the line array action. Yeah. And and what's happening there is that you've got a is is the temperature gradients is the speed of sound changes dependent upon the temperature. Okay, and so as the wind is blowing, it's cooler in one part of the array than it is the other part of the array. So the speed of sound is changing at that. Therefore, the the time that it takes from one part of the array to reach your ear versus another part of the array to reach your ear changes. So the cone filtering is changing because the, the because the wind is blowing. Even though if, if the wind's not blowing, it'll be constant. But as soon as that changes, now we have it's it's basically like a um, you know uh, a phaser on a guitar, a, a guitar effect. All that is is a straight signal that goes through. And then a delayed signal that they change the delay time, and the two more are mixed back together. That's all a right. phaser is, and um, and it's just a cancellation of the um, uh, that's uh, and they constantly change the um, the speed is what's changing the um, uh, the frequency of the of the, of the cancellation of the of the delay time. And so that's that swishy swishy sound, which is cool on a guitar, but not so cool on a PA. Right. So I was hoping to kind of keep this to an hour, and I just noticed that we're actually over our hour a little bit here, but there's a couple more questions if we yeah. want to briefly touch on them. Um, so Scott asked, uh, in a left-right system, a stereo configuration would be preferable to mono as far as comb filtering is concerned. Um, I think uh, an important distinction here, Scott, is, uh, you know, you, you talk about setting up a left-right system. Uh, and it being stereo, um, I think fundamentally from a system design standpoint, um, if you're going to do a left-right setup, you know, regardless to whether it's a stereo configuration, you know, where the, the left loudspeaker covers the whole seating area and the right loudspeaker covers the whole seating area, that, that would be a stereo setup. It's important to differentiate that between uh, the way a lot of PA systems are typically set up, which I would call a dual mono system, where you still have a left and a right loudspeaker, but the left loudspeaker is covering the left part of the audience and the right loudspeaker is covering the right part of the audience. Correct. In, yeah. that, in that case, you will have an overlap area in the middle, typically, and oftentimes there's an aisle down the middle. So, so uh, depending on you know how, <laughs> how wide the coverage is of the loudspeakers you're using and things like that, um, that that overlap area can be larger or smaller and the and thus the yeah. effects of the comb filtering where they meet be larger or smaller but i just wanted to take a second to differentiate those two cuz the system looks the same when you look at it right, right? you still have a left yeah. loudspeaker you still have a right loudspeaker you wire them up in stereo so that you can send something from my console to the left side send something to the right side i can send the same thing to both sides but if if those two loudspeakers are set up in such a way to cover where each of them cover the entire audience, sending a mono signal in equal level to both of those loudspeakers would be the worst case scenario for causing comb filtering through through the whole seating area. And again, you know, you think about it, wherever you are in that audience, you're some distance from the left loudspeaker and some distance from the right loudspeaker. Yep. As soon as you move, in that audience to a different spot. Now, your your distance from the left loudspeaker to the right loudspeaker has changed. So you right. can't use delay to fix that because wherever you are in the audience, you're a different distance than somebody else. Yeah, and you're a different distance from the loudspeaker, which means the amount the amount of comb filtering changes in in the depth of the comb filter, and it, it because of the level difference. And it also the the difference in arrival times changes the frequency. So if you've got two speakers that are not covering the each one is not covering the whole audience, the the dual mono as you talk about, or you could um, call it an exploded array, that type of thing. 
uh, right in the dead center is going to be a good place to listen. All the way to the left and all the way to the right are going to be good places to listen. But it's the areas when you're when you're not equal distance from the loudspeakers um, and you're still in within the coverage of that loudspeaker, those are where the problems are. And that's why LCR is, is a whole lot better because if you want something like, well, the, the lead singer's in the middle of the stage. I don't want to pan him to the left. That'll be, that'll be weird, weird. So that's where the LCR comes in. But that's also assuming that the um, that you have the budget for it because we're now we're talking another set of loudspeakers and amplifiers and processing, you know, weight on the roof, um, cable, the whole bit. So it comes down to a budgetary thing sometimes of what do you, you know what are we here to try to do? Okay, if we're trying to have the same experience for everybody, then a central mono system is definitely the best way to go. Now. If I'm in a studio and I want to create an experience, um, well, like say if I'm mixing a record, I'm trying to create a sonic experience for somebody that's listening on headphones or sitting in their living room listening to two to two stereo speakers. That's perfectly fine. But when you start to try to address 500 or 2,000 people, now is when we start having the problems because you cannot be equal distance to all the same people to the different people at the same time. Right, right. So uh, um, I think we pretty well covered this question here. Stan had asked, uh, how does comb filtering relate to different types of speaker systems? For example, line array versus um, a box like an SH96HO. I, I feel we pretty thoroughly covered that. Uh, well, let's, let's uh, go a little bit further on to that. In yeah. depends on which plane we're talking about, okay? In the in the left to right, let's say you've got a, a a pair of 96s left and right, and a line array left and right. Doesn't matter the brand, okay? Um, as you move front to back, you're going to hear interference issues in the line array due to the comb filtering. But with the with the single sources, you're not going to hear that. As you go left to right. You're going to hear that they're going to be equal. The, the differences between the two systems is going to be the same. I've got a source on the left. I've got a source on the right. If they're in the same position, the comb filtering is going to be the same happening left to right as it is. But front to back is where you'll hear the big differences. Oh, yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. Um, so I think the last question I have here, I've saved this one for last because uh, it doesn't relate so much to the comb filtering that we've been talking to. It's more of a, a product question, uh, a Danley uh, product question. But uh, uh, Ethan asked, uh, on paper, the TH812 seems to be comparable performance to the BC subs for much less money. Why does it not seem to be more popular or at least discussed online? How does the performance actually compare in real life? Well, that's a good question. First of all, I have not, I don't have anything to do with money side, so I'm not going to discuss. I don't even right. know what either one of them costs, so I'm going to avoid that uh, completely. Um, the uh, is and I've I've never done a comparison of them side by side to um, uh, to see how they actually stand up. Um, so uh, I don't have a real good answer on that. You know the um, um uh the the bc they are different technologies the the 812 is a tap horn while the bc is more is is a boundary compliant horn um so it, it would be considered a straight horn and we're not defeating physics we're just playing within the rules of the horn is actually bigger than it actually looks um on the bc and um uh, so it's um, uh, uh, it's more of a straight horn type of a thing, and um, and people like 18 inch drivers more than 12s because an 18's got to produce more 12 more low end than a 12. And um, the uh, a, a quick story I had a, a friend of mine over in Germany is uh, he uh, uh, does did a lot of uh, EDM stuff, and it was one festival he was looking at doing, and the promoter 
was uh, really hesitant because he didn't want him to bring out his 812s because 12s are no good for low end and we need to have deep low end. And he convinced him to give it a try. And at the end of the first show that he did, he told him that if the promoter said, if you ever show up and you don't bring these, it'll be the last time that you show up here because I want these on every one of my events. And um, so, he, you know, some people are just hung up on driver size. And to be honest with you, that's some of the reason that we have some of the double eight teams because that word double 18 just rings a bell with so many people. And um, yeah, never mind. Uh, never mind having a single 18 that can perform as well as most double 18s yeah. do. Um, it's only a single 18 and nobody wants to hear that. They want yeah. that. I need that two eighteen action. So yeah. well, I've, I've noticed then, one... don't them, then don't let them know that you're bringing a, a two twelve. you know, yeah. so we'll, <laughs> it'll perform most, uh, most well, I noticed that one manufacturer is is they're upping the game. They've got a double nineteen. They've, they've got double a, 19. It, it, it's a front loaded cabinet, but it's a double nineteen. So it's got to be better than a double eighteen. So I'm and I'm gonna leave that at that. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Nathan just said uh, uh people like the distortion of the cone break up in the eighteen inch. <laughs> and which is true. There, that that is part of the sound. But and if if you do like that, and I'm not going to argue about that, but do not discuss audio quality. The the right. term audio quality will not enter into any part of any discussion. If you like the 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 you know, it's like well, I like the sound of my Marshall amplifier. That's great, but it's not the sound of the guitar. So let's right. don't talk about accuracy. If you like that distortion, then that's fine. I'm not going to argue with that. And some people right. do like the, the extra harmonics that come off of front-loaded subs. That's a sound that they prefer. Other people don't like it. So that is a personal preference. So, right. you know. Well, I think with that, we're going we're gonna to wrap this up here a little bit. Um, going to switch over here. And um, uh, let's see. Oh, um, so yeah, I just wanted to, before we wrap this up, I just wanted to remind everyone, you know, this is going to be a regular Thursday thing. We're going to try to keep it uh, to an hour or less. Uh, so it's not, you know, eating up everybody's day completely. Um, you know, we went a little longer than that today, but I thought we had some really great questions going on. And, uh, and I really appreciate everybody showing up and asking questions. If anybody has any topics that they would like to see covered, or, or something that you would like uh, somebody from Danley to talk about with these fireside chats, please let us know. Um, also, let us know how, you, how you've how you heard about these, uh, these fireside chats. I know uh, this one was a little, a little short notice for a lot of folks since, uh, you know, we just put the flyer up uh, yesterday, I guess, and, uh, and Ivan had posted about it on, uh, on what, Tuesday. Tuesday so, afternoon. Yeah, so so I know this one was a little bit short notice, but I thought we had a really fantastic turnout. I appreciate everybody showing up. Um, but yeah, uh, let us know if there's topics you want us to talk about, or people you'd like to hear from, or or you'd like to have somebody's uh, somebody's take on something. Um, let let us know. We'll uh, we'd be glad to try and get uh, get some of that info in here. Um, so anyway, uh, I guess that pretty well wraps it up for today. Um, Everybody we stay safe record. out there. Yeah, everybody stay safe out there. We did record this. Um, we are going to make it available. Uh, I think we've been talking about possibly uh, putting this up on our YouTube channel. So we'll see if we can't get that done in uh, in the near future here. So so thanks everyone for coming and and have a great.